hello to to all of you uh, let me see if uh, okay so I'll start my um, lecture um, in um, at uh, 2 30 okay um, sorry for the delay um, this problem with zoom integration so um, I will just try to wait for others to join in and then we can start with um, our um, afternoon session but I would like to remind everyone to please um, have with you your um, um, the PowerPoint slides uh, because I won't be able to share them because of uh, our problem with uh, zoom integration so I have no choice but to do this manually, and I hope you will bear with me. Um, I try to prepare uh, 74 slides for everyone so I can uh, make this um, lecture um, understandable. Uh, but unfortunately, there's a problem with, um, with Zoom. Uh, we really tried uh, our best uh, to integrate our uh, Zoom meeting but i think there's a problem with um, with the with the technology uh so we have no choice um so i'll start my lecture um exactly 2 30. uh so let's have uh, by the way i'd like to take this opportunity to thank uh, the president of the philippine associations of law schools our dean mari for the opportunity and of course uh dean al suede of uh, University of Cebu for um, the assistance uh, is actually doing the the technical work for the um, PALS uh, Facebook Live. Okay, so um, I hope uh, my uh, audio is loud and clear. Yes, mayong hapon sa tanan. Um, good afternoon to all. Magandang hapon sa lahat. Assalamu alaikum to, to everyone. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak uh, to all those uh, serving them, uh, the holy month of Ramadan. So we're, we have uh, 547 um, audience uh, at this moment. Uh, by the way, um, I'd like to congratulate also the graduating class of uh, 2020 and of course our 2019 bar uh, passers. Uh, you did a, a job well done, everyone. So can you please tell me if my audio is loud and clear? Okay, good, Alexander Tandok. Thank you, thank you very much. Mayong hapon din. Okay, so um, yeah, we can start at uh, 2.30. So I hope you have your slides, uh, would be better. You know, uh, I had my own printed copy, so I have to follow through these slides. Hello, Dean Torion. How are you? Hello, good afternoon, um, Dean Juan. This is my second time to to do this. Uh, I did. I tried this once um, in our, on our Facebook page, uh, and um, yeah, the. I don't know how to, how should I um, describe my feeling talking to, to the phone. Okay, three minutes to go, then we can start a lecture. Again, I'd like to remind everyone to please um, have your um, slides so we can um, do what would help you know, if you have your slides with you.
I really tried to have my to have a haircut, but unfortunately, uh, my uh, quarantine pass uh, wouldn't allow me to have um, a haircut. Uh, so, please bear with me. Okay, so uh, once again, good afternoon to all of you. Magandang hapon, maayong hapon sa tanan. And uh, uh, the topic that I will be discussing this afternoon is um, quite new to everyone, uh, but not actually new in the Philippines. We'll try to to know that why uh, competition law is not actually new to the Philippine legal system. Uh, as you might have, I think, uh, uh, those who might, those who are following me on Twitter, that uh, I've shared an entirely different point of view um, with respect to the uh, closure. Not actually closure, but um, uh, the, um, the expiration of the franchise of ABS-CBN. Um, let me bring in this to our discussion because of the importance of competition law in the context of uh, the ABS-CBN case. Uh, those who might have read my uh, my uh, sh- short um, opinion about the controversy, that I try to look at the case in the context of competition policy and competition law. Uh, yes, uh, competition is uh, important in the discussions of EBS-CBN uh, because that would limit our options. That would limit our options. Uh, that would also disin- disincentivize other players in the market not to uh, uh, provide a better, um, probably better broadcasting services because there will be lesser competition in the market. Uh, while uh, it's it's true to to say that. Um, there will there are still competi- there is still competition in the market because you have EBS you have channel 7 you have channel 5 you have PTB4 but that is not the the point the point is uh the competition um there is a listening of competition and I, that's the concern of um competition law why is that important why is it important uh, that there is competition uh, may I bring in, uh, may I call your attention to please prepare your slides so we can start. Uh, my presentation, the outline of my presentation will be, we'll try to talk about the general principles of competition law. Uh, then uh, we will also try to look into the, um, a brief overview of the United States and European competition law system. Uh, this is important. This is not, I would like to, to inform everyone that this is not a, a strictly comparative uh, discussion, but it's important that we talk about the uh, European uh, Union competition law system and that of the United States antitrust law because of the fact that uh, the Philippine Competition Law or the Philippine Competition Act uh, is modeled from these um, um, two systems. Uh, you will uh, later on discover that our our law is actually a fusion of United States uh, antitrust law and that of the European Union competition. So that's the importance of why we need to talk about uh, the uh, U.S. and EU competition law systems. Uh, we will also try to talk about uh, the historical evolutions of Philippine competition law system. Uh, this is important uh, so that you'll have a, a deeper understanding of the development of competition law in, uh, in the Philippines and that uh, for you to understand that this law is not actually new in the Philippines. As a matter of fact, competition law, is, as a matter of fact, uh, Philippines uh, is the first among the Asian countries to have competition law. So our competition law history is quite old. Uh, it has a colonial uh, history. 
Then uh, I'll jump into substantive liability provisions of the Philippine Competition Act. Uh, given the, the time limit, I would not be able, I don't think I would be able to cover the entire uh, provisions of the Philippine Competition Act. But this is just an introductory uh, lecture, so we will cover those important provisions. The substantive liability provisions. What are those prohibited acts? Then uh, I hope I will still have the time and I'll talk about institutional enforcement framework of our Philippine competition. We'll talk about some of the uh, procedural characteristics of Philippine competition law enforcement, the uh, um, organizational makeup of uh, the Philippine Competition Commission. Okay. So uh, let's start with the general uh, overview. Competition law and competition policy. Um, yes, uh, they are. They can be used interchangeably. Uh, if you're going to read literatures, uh, at times they use competition policy or competition law. But you, you should know that uh, while they are interchangeably, competition law and competition policy are not actually identical. Uh, when we talk about competition law, we talk about uh, legal body of legal rules and standards, while competition policy is quite broader uh, than competition law. You talk about uh, uh, formulations of competition policy in the first place. So uh, uh, we have that in our, uh, uh, in our slide, the uh, distinction of competition law and competition policy. Uh, it is also important that we also uh, make a distinction between uh, competition and regulation. Uh, strictly speaking, uh, there is a distinction between competition and, comp and regulation. That's why you also have your sector regulators. But under Philippine law, all competition issue is under, under the new law under the jurisdictions of the Philippine Competition Act. And you will also discover later on that uh, while there is a distinction between competition and regulation, because in regulations, uh, there is more interventions on the part of sector regulators, competition has an aspect of regulations. So uh, again, uh, the two are not that far unrelated. Okay, so what is competition law that's it's important that we we define the term what is competition uh, law uh, by the way our competition uh, law in the Philippines is both a product of colonial transplant and congressional legal transplant and we'll try to explain that competition law and antitrust law you might be be asked you might be wondering why do we? What's the the difference between antitrust law and competition law? There is actually no distinction. They are no. They it's just that in the United States they use the term antitrust law because of its historical uh, um, um, significance uh, uh, to the trust at that time. Uh, so it's, this is not, when you talk about antitrust law, this is not about trust as we understood it in, in civil law, okay? Uh, but the common term being used now is more comp is competition law. In other jurisdictions, they also use the term anti-monopoly, like, for example, in Japan. But again and again, if I will be using the term antitrust law, or competition law, the two are the same, okay? I am just interchangeably using the term. If you're going to look into our Philippine jurisprudence, uh, we use the term antitrust law. Uh, uh, you can't find the term competition law. Okay, so I've, I've also noticed that some are using the term anti-competition. That is not actually correct, no? Uh, it's an oxymoron, so uh, it's not you cannot use anti-competition it's it should be competition law or antitrust law okay so what do we mean by uh, uh, competition law or antitrust law by the way uh, somebody reminded me 
uh, uh, JP Abilia. By the way, why do we have to talk about competition law? We need to talk about competition law because it's now part of, for the first time, uh, there was an attempt last 2018 to include this in the bar examinations, but I think it was eventually dropped in the bar coverage. But now in 2019, starting these bar examinations, this coming 2019, we, 2020 I mean, which is now moved to 2021, uh, um, competition is part of the mercantile law. Uh, so it's important that you you'll have a an, at least an overview of what is uh, competition law. Okay. Let's uh, proceed to the definition because this is an introductory course, so it's important that we define the term. Okay, competition law consists of rules that are intended to protect the process of competition in order to maximize consumer welfare. So that's the definitions offered by Wish and Bailey. Uh, you will note uh, that uh, it gives emphasis on the protection to the process of competition. It's not the competition per se that is being protected by competition law, but it's actually the process, the dynamic process of competition. Uh, and uh, these definitions of uh, uh, Wish and Bailey uh, emphasizes the, uh, the, the focus of competition law, uh, 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 that is uh, to promote, uh, uh, to maximize consumer welfare. We'll try to define later on uh, what do we mean by by consumer welfare because it's uh, quite a problematic term in the context of competition law. Although consumer welfare is a well-defined term in economics but not in the context of antitrust law or competition law. It is also concerned with ensuring the firms or undertakings as it's using in the law operating in free market economy do not restrict or distort competition. So you also talk about restriction or or distortion of competition in a way that prevents the market from functioning optimally. Because if there is a market distortion, there is a market restriction again and again, uh, the, um, uh, the consumers, uh, the public uh, will, will, not, will, will be affected uh, if there is this uh, a distortion. It is also the study of competition. It is a body of law that seeks to ensure competitive markets through the interactions of sellers and buyers in the, the dynamic process of exchange. Uh, so, again, when we talk about uh, competition law, again, we talk about ensuring competitive markets. Uh, another definition offered by uh, uh, Habenkamp is that it concerned with maintaining competition in the private market. So you will note that uh, the definition seems simple. It talks about protecting the process of competition. It talks about ensuring that the market works, that there is no distortion in the market. It ensures that there is competitive markets. That's why uh, cartel price fixing, for example, is illegal. Uh, it's illegal. Uh, so while the definition seems simple, competition is without saying very controversial. For example, it is, uh, it is hard to provide the definitions of competition. Uh, everyone will agree. Or to obtain a consensus about the reasons of having competition. So there is still debate among scholars. The debate is still vibrant as to whether uh, in, the context of the, uh, in the context of development, whether competition is really important in the context of development, in the context of developing countries. So that is quite a, 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 um, a vibrant debate. Uh, there's also a controversy over the role of competition in regulating markets um, and also debate surrounding the goal of competition law. And you will later on uh, uh, try to give an overview of uh, what is the goal of competition law or what are the goals of competition law. Because uh, among the most uh, widely debated uh, aspect of competition law by scholars and even by the courts is the goal of competition law. What is really the goal of competition law? Um, we, will, we will try to, to do that. Uh, 
As I've said again, competition law is not actually new in the Philippines. We do have a lot of jurisprudence dealing with issues on competition. So I'd like to, to quote one uh, important provisions that has something to do with, with competition. And these decisions of uh, the Supreme Court in the case of Gukong Wei Jr. versus Securities and Exchange Commission uh, decided in 1979. Uh, this is in relation to the 1973, uh, uh, in relation to the antitrust constitutional clause of the 1973 constitution. Okay, so in this particular case, the Supreme Court described the nature of competition law. Uh, uh, what did the court uh, uh, said? No, but it, what is this case all about? Uh, uh, the this Gukongwe case. Uh, uh, is a case where the Supreme Court uh, used uh, article uh, used um, article um, uh, rather section 2 of article uh, 14 of the 1973 constitutions and uh, article 186 of the revised penal code. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the court took note that this antitrust law referring to the revised penal code article 186, we will uh, later on, uh, discuss Article 186 as a, as a penal competitional regime. Okay, in this particular case, uh, I I would be better, but after this lecture, you go, you try to read the full text of Gukongwe case versus Securities and Exchange Commission. I've cited it in our slide. What did the court uh, note in, in, in so far as the nature of competition law? According to the Supreme Court, uh, this antitrust law <clears throat> or laws referring to referring to <coughs> sorry referring to the constitutional clause on competition law and that of the revised penal code uh, against monopolies and combinations in restraint of trade are aimed at raising the levels of competition by improving the consumer's effectiveness as the final arbiter of arbiter in the free markets. You see. Under, uh, uh, under competition law, it's actually the consumers that are given that, you know, that uh, final uh, arbiter in the market. Whether to buy that product, whether to watch Channel 7 or to watch Channel 2, that's supposed to be left to the, to the consumer to decide. Um, these laws, according to the court, is designed, are designed to preserve free and fettered competition as a rule of trade. And, and going back to the definitions that we have, this talks about unfettered competition. That is why uh, you will note in the definition, competition law speaks about, uh, about uh, ensuring that uh, the firms operating in the free market economy do not distort or, or restrict competition. So that is in relation to, to, uh, to Gukongwe case. Uh, the court also further quoted um, U.S. landmark case of Standard Oil, um, where uh, the United States Supreme Court said that, uh, referring to competition antitrust law, it rests on the premise that an and restrained interactions of competitive forces will yield the best allocations of economic resources, the lowest prices, and the highest quality. If you have competition in the market, for example, if you have more competition, if you have EBS, CBN, if you have channel 7, if you have uh, channel 5 and you add more channels, that gives these competitors in the market the incentive to, to provide a better service, better product. Because they know that if you're not going to, to, to produce a better product, you will you will, you know, you uh, you will uh, move to to the other product. Uh, there is substitution, but if you only have one, for example, just for example, you only have channel seven. Let's remove channel channel uh, uh, five, channel four. If you only have channel seven, if you only have channel seven, channel seven wouldn't mind of improving uh, its own. Uh, uh, product, its own services, because you don't have a choice. That will not lead you to to uh, to transfer to the other channel. So that's the importance of 
of having competition. It always redounds to the benefit of the consumer. Better services, better product, and lower prices. As a consumer, we are always concerned with lower prices. Kaya always tayo tawad ng tawad. Kahit mayroon pang uh, ni, uh, price tag yung produkto, mohang yung gihapon. No? Diba? Uh, would she ask for, for discount? Pag may sale, ang Pinoy, pag may sale, dadagsain ng mga malls. And that only speaks of the importance of competition law because we always want lower prices. But of course, we don't just settle to lower prices but poor products. Dapat balance. So that's what competition law is trying to address. You will have a better services, better products at a lower cost on the part of the producer at a lower price on the part of on the part of the buyer so i hope that 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 makes it clear okay uh so concept of competition law what do we mean what are the things that, that need to be to be underscored when we talk about competition law again competition law is generally a generally negative or prohibitory in other words uh, competition law does not directly encourage competition or firms or force firms to compete. No, uh, competition law doesn't do that. I'll give you an example. When Grab and Uber, when uh, Grab, when Uber decided to leave the market, leave the Asian market, and entered into an acquisition uh, 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 agreement no, uh, with with. Uh, I know, rather, when, when Grab uh, tri- uh, acquired uh, uh, Uber uh, because of uh, the, the plan of Uber to, to leave the Asian market. Uh, uh, we know that that will lead to, to uh, listening competition in the market. Because that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that leaves us to only one, one uh, player, and that is Grab. And I think you know the impact of Grab, uh, how as to pricing, you know. uh, But can, for example, can Philippine Competition Commission compel Grab to, st- I mean Uber to stay in the market because leaving the market would would lead to 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 monopoly, would lead to monopoly of of. Uh, Grab uh, to the market. No, it can. It, uh, uh, PCC, uh, the Philippine competition cannot do that because that is not the concern of uh, competition. Competition law is not there to force you to go to the market, but rather the the but rather the law uh, provides certain uh, certain provisions that would ensure certain uh, limitations that would ensure that there is competition in the market. In other words, uh, competition law does not directly encourage competition or force firm to compete, but rather six through employment of specific rules to prevent or eliminate any situation uh, deemed harmful, deemed harmful to, to competition and in this way protect the process of competition and this covers a variety of uh, situations stretching from uh, those uh, dealing with anti-competitive behavior or abusive conduct in the context of merger and in the context of monopolization that's one one concept that we need to highlight in the context of competition law another one in the market economy the consumer not the state dictates what goods and services are provided. Okay, that's, I think, self-explanatory. If there is a higher demand on, on for example, on face masks, then that, you know, uh, that, uh, that leads to, to higher productions. Okay, that leads to higher production because there is, so there is, uh, when we talk about competition again, it's it's also important that we put this in the context of uh, of uh, supply and demand. Consumer demand, uh, uh, consumer demand drives production. So these are uh, those are the 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 basic concepts 
uh, uh, that are uh, associated to the study of competition. So let me proceed now to the goals of competition. As I have said earlier, uh, one of the most uh, hate, um, not hate, uh, most uh, debated aspect of competition law is what is the goal of competition law? What is the goal of competition law? Um, I've listed three uh, goals, economic, social, and political. Understanding competition law is not only take note is not only dissecting legislative text and judicial decisions according to settled canons of interpretations, but it's also about understanding the the particular forces that have influenced uh, the directions of competition policy at particular times. That's why it's important that we we highlight. Uh, uh, the, the goal of competition. According to a very famous uh, antitrust law scholars in the United States who wrote the influential book, The Antitrust Paradox, um, if you are a, a competition law scholar, uh, it's always a must that, that we read uh, The Antitrust Paradox because of um, its, its contribution to, to the development of uh, competition law. Okay. Uh, hello, Dean. Just got, while, while it's goal, uh, promote consumer price regulations. Uh, we will try to. Uh, um, okay, I will try to answer that. But as I'm going to uh, uh, go over the, the the slide on the goals of competition uh, law. Okay. Uh, according to Professor Bork, uh, he opined that uh, antitrust policy cannot make rational until we are able to give a firm answer to one one fundamental question. That is, what is the point of the law? What are its goals? You will note that uh, Professor Bork is the one, the first to articulate the concept of consumer welfare as a goal of antitrust law, uh, although uh, not in the way that it's understood in the in the in the economic uh, uh, parlance, okay. So uh, goals of competition um, law, um, but it is now settled that uh, the instrumental goal of competition law is consumer welfare, which is defined in economics, but. Uh, but none, nevertheless, not well agreed, not well defined uh, as an antitrust context uh, or an, in, in, in antitrust law. Uh, according to another uh, U.S. Uh, antitrust law scholar, uh, Professor Havenkamp, he said that after 30 years, the debate over antitrust ideology has uh, has quieted. Most now agree that the protection of consumer welfare should be the only goal of antitrust law. And that leads us to the economic goal of uh, competition law. What is the economic goal of competition law? Uh, economic, when we talk about economic goal, we talk about economic efficiency and the maximizations of consumer welfare. Okay, and this is considered, as I have mentioned a while ago, as the main goal of competition law. So what is consumer welfare? Uh, consumer welfare. Uh, unfortunately, it's embarrassing to note that uh, there is an inability on the part of jurisprudence to converge into one meaning of the core, uh, of this core concept, the meaning of uh, consumer welfare. But today, there are two major groups of thought on consumer of the meaning of consumer welfare. One argues that the term should mean consumer surplus. And the other assert that the appropriate meaning is total surplus or aggregate welfare. In plain English, consumer surplus refers to the perceived welfare of buyers in a particular market. While total surplus 
refers to the perceived welfare of buyers and sellers in a particular market. Thus, the total surplus uh, standard disregards wealth transfers between consumers and welfare uh, and sellers. Okay, so that is uh, uh, the, the meaning of uh, consumer welfare in the context of antitrust law. Uh, competition law has also social goal. Um, and you have uh, it there on the slides, uh, safeguarding the consumer from undue exercise of market power, uh, dispersions of socioeconomic power of large firms, protect, uh, protection of democratic values and principles, ensuring market fairness and equity, mainly through wealth distribution in society. This is a very broad uh, goal of competition law. Uh, uh, but but take note that an approach to competition law which embraces a social goal or objective uh, uh, social goal or objective rest on antipathy towards the risk of private power and receives legitimacy from the principles of justice and economic equity in a market democracy uh, it has uh, uh, as to to quote uh, uh, Former U.S. President uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt once said that the liberty of democracy can be threatened if the people tolerate the growth of private power to a point where it becomes stronger than their democratic state itself. And so that's uh, also one aspect of competition law. When we talk about competition law in achieving a social goal. Uh, competition law has also political goal. Uh, while this appeared to be questionable at first place, uh, at first glance, several situations uh, may arise in practice in which decisions of politicians prevail over decisions of competition authorities. As you will note that uh, political institutions uh, played a vital role in shaping competition uh, competition uh, law. Okay, so uh, what about the Philippine Competition Law? What is the goal of the Philippine Competition Act? Uh, if you're going to examine the declaration of policy of Republic Act 10667, uh, that is our Philippine Competition Act, you will note that our law manifests the three goals of competition law. There is that economic goal, there is that social goal, and also political goal. So our, our law it has a broader goal, and, and this is one of the uh, essential distinctions of competition law in, in developing world, and in developed world, because in developed world, in developed economies, it seems settled that the only goal of competition or the primary, the goal of competition is economic efficiency, it's consumer welfare. But in developing countries, the use, as is in the Philippines, use competition law not only in not uh, not only to consumer welfare but to other other uh, other um, other non-economic goals so it has both economic and non-economic goals so if i if you will uh, read um, uh, the declaration of policy under section 2 uh, you will find in the law uh, such as about uh, talking about um, uh, employment, talking about uh, 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 distribution, of, uh, talking about trade. It talks about uh, other non uh, non non uh, economic uh, concept. Uh, this has nothing to do with with consumer welfare. So uh, our law has a a broader has a broader uh, 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 has a broader goal as as is as usually typical in a developing uh, country. Okay, characteristics of let's proceed to the characteristics of competition law. 
characteristics of competition law. Let's start. The first one is prohibition. What is this? Prohibition. The first uh, characteristic of competition law that should be mentioned is prohibition. Uh, prohibition. The, this uh, brings us to the discussion uh, of how competition law is prohibitory in nature and negative in its wording. Why it's negative in its wording? You have anti-competitive agreement. It's, adult, it's negative. Abuse of dominance. It's again in the negative uh, uh, term, in the negative wording. In fact, even uh, uh, antitrust law is, the, is also in, the, in a negative wording. You have uh, your um, unlawful mergers or acquisitions or prohibited mergers or acquisitions. So normally, the term use is in the negative. As I said, that's why it's important that we deal about uh, uh, the first characteristic, which is prohibition. Uh, as a legal provision containing prohibition, uh, we, we, we also have, uh, uh, we applied uh, um, extremely, uh, we applied rather uh, this uh, law to declare uh, agreements illegal. Okay, so that's why it's prohibitory. So you have, in this context, you have your per se approach. Cartel, for example, the law prohibits fixing of prices. The mere, ex the mere agreement of two competitors to fix the price or to divide the market. O ikaw, dyan ka lang magbibinta sa, uh, sa, sa uh, Quezon City. Ako sa akin ang Pasay. That is market division. That is market distribution which is prohibited by competition law okay because that has that would have the effect of of uh, uh, listening the competition in the market uh, it it why because it you know it limits the the, the choices of uh, the 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 consumer okay um, another one regulations we talk about regulations Competition law contains elements of regulations. A regulatory approach is adopted in relation to business phenomena where it would be necessary to conduct an analysis in order to determine the anti-harmful and or the beneficial competitive effects or the pro-competitive effects. And you see this in the merger review. For example, in a merger review, the... Uh, Competition Authority, the Philippine Competition Commission, in the case of the Philippines, will have to determine whether itong, itong merger ba to, itong acquisition ba to, mayroon ba siyang anti-competitive effects? In other words, is it harmful to the competition? Is it harmful? Or it, mayroon ba siyang pro-competitive effects? Or it, is it beneficial to, 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 to the competition? So, uh, the the uh, the competition authority through its merger uh, office uh, use um, economic tools conduct market analysis and try to balance uh, you know uh, uh, the anti competitive or the pro competitive effect and that is where rule of reason rule of reason comes into play. That is what rule of reason is. No? You balance the, uh, you determine the anti, you balance the anti-competitive and the pro-competitive uh, effects of a certain agreements. Uh, so that is regulations. Another important characteristics of competition law is exemption and exclusion. Uh, as you will note that uh, even in our law, you have a provisions uh, as some dealing with with exemption and exclusion. Uh, I, mean, I call your attention, for example, in the case of Section 21, talks about exemption from prohibited mergers and acquisitions. So a competition statute would always have this kind of exemption. Like, for example, in the United in the European Union, they have this what you call black exemption, where certain agreements are are uh, excluded from uh, uh, competition law scrutiny. Okay, so you that is also uh, existing in, in the case of 
competition law. Exclusion in the context, for example, of uh, a possible that prohibition on collusion may not apply to vertical agreements because a legislative decision was made to exclude this from the same prohibition. So it's again a choice on the part of of the legislative body to to exclude certain uh, uh, agreements, regardless of the fact that uh, it has that element of uh, collusion. I hope um, everyone is uh, following through my 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 discussions. Another important aspect of competition law is penalty, and this is very very crucial. I tell you why is this crucial because. One of the reasons, I articulated that one of the reasons why, despite that we have a long history of antitrust law in the Philippines, one of the primary reasons why there was a sort of under-enforcement of our competition law, as uh, uh, provided in the Revised Penal Code, because of penalty. Take note that the penalty of Article 186 was never amended when this was since in the 1930s when the revised penal code uh, took effect until article 186 was replaced by the provisions of the philippine competition act the penalty remains the same just imagine 200 pesos so there is no deterrence effect. That's why it's important that we talk about penalties. Now, modern competition law, you will see, as you will see, for example, in, in the Philippine, Comp you, uh, Philippine Competition Act, that you talk about hundreds of millions as a penalty versus 200 pesos. One of the reasons why, uh, the, when the Sherman Act was transplanted in the Philippines, as it was later on converted into the provisions of uh, Article 186, hindi siya naging importante, no? naging parang police matter siya because aside from the fact that it was included into to the revised penal code, it would have been better if it uh, remains a special law, special penal law. Uh, dahil 200 pesos lang. But the source of that provision, which is the Antitrust Act of the United States, Grab yung changes in the penalty to a hundreds of millions of US dollars to from that six six thousand dollar. No. So grab yung change. So that's why penalty is very important. And you will note, for example, in our in under the new law, under revised penal code, and not and under the Philippine Competition Act. For example, first offense for administrative fines, you talk about 100 million first offense. Second offense, 100 millions, but not more than 250 millions. So that is why, so that's now the changes in the law. We now talk about, about hundreds of millions of penalty. But there are still some scholars arguing that the the... The penalty provided in our law is still not enough to deter hardcore cartels, okay, uh, in terms of the market size of the Philippines. But at least to my mind, this is a huge improvement. That's why uh, it is uh, 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 claimed that uh, the Philippine Competition Act is hailed as a game changer uh, in so far as competition enforcement um, is concerned in the Philippines. Another aspect of competition law and other characteristics is it's being interdisciplinary. Okay. Interdisciplinary. You will note that competition enforcement involves a lot of economic analysis. The more the kayang ihiwalay ang economist in, in, in competition enforcement. It's always a dual system. You have a lawyer, you have an economist because the economist do, uh, is in charge in doing the market analysis and that's very important. That's why when you study about competition law, I'm so sorry that we earlier we talked about some economic principles. 
in fact uh, it would have been more probably boring if uh, and you might be be wondering whether am i really lecturing on 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 uh, subject matter in law or or about economics because uh, competition law is very interdisciplinary okay uh, it, it it involves uh, uh, some political ideologies and and also economic uh, uh, thinkings okay uh, what uh, what are the factors that influence very quickly that influence uh, the shape of competition this is very important in the context of the characteristic of competition law as being interdisciplinary okay you have politics economics and institutions politics plays a vital role in in uh, in competition law in shaping competition law because when we talk about consumer welfare it's really an issue of a public is a public policy issue it's a public policy issue so it plays a vital role in in shaping competition law economics also plays a vital role in shaping competition law and i'll give you for example in the united states there is this debate between the structuralist and that the interventionist you no know, the chicago school and that of the harvard school so uh, it, that that's very important in the in the european union for example the ordo liberalism thinking also plays a vital role in the development of the uh, the uh, european union case law institutions institutions also plays a vital role because you will note that there are different uh, models or designs uh, of institutions in 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 the context of competition law in the united states for example it's a tripartite system you have the antitrust division you have the uh, you have private enforcement and you have uh, the uh, federal trade commissions and these uh, three institutions you can actually institute institute you can institute antitrust complaints simultaneously so that's how it's being designed in the united states tripartite in in european union you know that Competition law is purely administrative. Walang criminal sanction ang European competition law. In United States, uh, most of the antitrust cases are private enforcement. Private enforcement because of the tribal damages, no, lacking Daniels, lacking award, no, sa sa private uh, uh, the firm that's that's uh, being a victim of uh, uh, the anti-competitive or uh, or a victim of uh, anti-competitive uh, uh, agreement or, or 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 victim of abuse of dominance. So because of that, uh, the choice is more on private enforcement. In in the European Union. It's the the more enforcement, more cases are premised on administrative enforcement. Now, in the Philippines, for example, it's also unique. It's an entirely different uh, design because while uh, we seem to model our our law to the United States and to the European Union, there's a distinctions. While we do have private actions, we also have criminal sanction. We have then administrative you have the pcc it's not actually tripartite because private action criminal action is dependent on the actions of the philippine competition commission there must first be a prior uh, inquiry so magkakaiba so you know these uh, plays a very important role in shaping addressing competition law Okay, so let me proceed to what are the typical provisions that you see in competition law. So, bin you magiging legal na tayo, ah, uh, sa ating, uh, what time is it now? Let me see, uh, 3.17, I have to end my lecture. I hope I be able to finish it uh, before, uh, by, you know, uh, finish the lecture uh, at around 4.30. Uh, okay, because I only have uh, two hours, okay. Okay, what are the common typical provisions that you see in any antitrust uh, statute or any competition law statute? Uh, you have prohibitions, number one. You have your prohibitions on collusion. 
uh, horizontal and vertical situations. Uh, you talk. This is, is about, for example, cartel. Uh, to to uh, competitors uh, fixing the price. For example, uh, you have uh, um, uh, Toyota and uh, Nissan uh, fixing the price of their product. Uh, that they agreed that oh, this is going to the price that we're going to to uh, 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 the price for this product. So that is in the nature of uh, uh, collusions or, pro, uh, or horizontal agreement. Prohibition on abuse of dominance, that's also typical in a, um, in a competition law. Uh, you have it in, in, our, in our law, uh, the abuse of dominant positions. So let me go back again. Prohibitions on collusions in horizontal and vertical situations. Uh, if you have the Philippine Competition Act, that's, that is in your section 14 of the Philippine Competition Act. So that is your prohibitions on collusions in horizontal and vertical situations. We'll try to explain later what's these horizontal and vertical situations. Then you have prohibitions on abuse of dominance. You have your section 15, no? your abuse of dominant uh, position provisions. Uh, uh, in, in the United States, they have the, uh, the concept of uh, monopolization or attempt to monopolize. That's the term. And then uh, regulating mergers. We also have uh, uh, merger regulations uh, under Chapter 4 of the Philippine Competition Act, you have um, uh, from uh, Section 16 up to uh, Section 21. No, you have uh, the provisions on merger regulation. So, so these are the what I call the antitrust substantive liability provisions. Again, these are the substantive liability provisions. You have your anti-competitive agreements, your abuse of dominant position, and then your prohibited mergers or acquisitions okay so uh, what is the scope uh, what are uh, agreements affecting competition so we have horizontal agreements vertical agreements and then concentrations uh, and then unilateral conduct affecting competition these are the scope of competition law so let's have example uh, hardcore agreements hardcore agreements price fixing that's we, we also have this uh, this is uh, under the pressure rule. Uh, the moment that you agree to fix the price, whether you have, take note, whether you have implemented the, the agreement, the agreed price, that is, uh, that is uh, prohibited. That is it. Somebody asked me, I will not, although delved on this, whether uh, the IDP uh, tariffs, uh, violates um, uh, the provisions? Well, a straightforward answer, yes. No, it violates, uh, uh, it constitutes price fixing of services. And there are uh, jurisprudence in the United States that declared it in violations of the antitrust law. So I leave it uh, there, okay? Anti-competitive agreements, uh, under Section 14, you have your price fixing, you have also your output restrictions. In most jurisdictions, like in the United States and European Union, output restrictions, uh, uh, territorial divisions, falls under, under per se regulations, per se rule, per se approach, but not in the Philippine uh, uh, law. We will discuss uh, this later on. Why territorial divisions uh, uh, is not falling under the per se violations. In other words, uh, when we talk about price fixing as per se under the pressure rule, uh, you don't you don't evaluate whether it has a pro-competitive effect or or anti-competitive effect because by its nature such agreement has a pernicious uh, uh, effect uh, and so it is uh, deemed um, considered illegal. Uh, so as with output restrictions and territorial divisions under uh, U.S. and EU competition law system, but not in, in the context of Philippine Competition Act because that is covered by your Section 14B. Cooperation agreements, we also have this, uh, uh, research and development, uh, joint buying agreement, uh, specialization agreement. Uh, uh, these are also examples of horizontal agreements. 
but these are not uh, uh, these are not um, um, under the per se rule but they are being um, evaluated under the um, rule of reason analysis okay vertical example of vertical agreements uh, vertical price fixing agreements there are two vertical agreements in other word uh, agreements uh, uh, involving you have the manufacturer and uh, the dealer no that's a vertical no uh, but when you talk about uh, horizontal uh, the parties involved are in the same uh, uh, chain Ma uh, you have manufacturer manufacturer but in the vertical uh, agreements you have for example your uh, downstream and your upstream no um, agreement so one is we can divide uh, vertical agreements uh, on our slide number 18 uh, for uh, one uh, vertical price fixing agreements and vertical non price fixing agreements um, you have your minimum retail price maximum retail price you also have vertical non price fixing agreements uh, which is, is exclusive distribution agreements exclusive uh, purchasing agreements selective distribution agreements okay let me just check somebody's asking me uh, dean there's exception saying that an agreement that cons contribute improving okay we will discuss that now that the uh, vents uh, earl uh, columnas uh, what you were asking is actually not uh, under the per se rule, but that's in fact under the paragraph C uh, of, se of, our, of section 14 that involves uh, your other, that's the catch-all provisions, uh, that, that is a provision that involves, uh, that, that covers uh, vertical agreements where you have, uh, you have to use the uh, uh, rule of reason analysis or the uh, object or effect based analysis plus that objective exceptions under uh, the last uh, paragraph, uh, which we copied from uh, Article 101, Paragraph uh, 3 of the uh, Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. We'll discuss that uh, events earl columnas, okay, uh, in the, when we reach uh, uh, the provisions of the Philippine Competition Act. Okay, let me proceed. Uh, okay, uh, 325, tinitingnan ko yung oras because ayaw kong sumobra. Okay, example of unilateral conduct. Uh, unilateral conduct. These are unilateral because it's unilateral. Okay, gagaling, for example, to one uh, one entity or a group of entity. You have price discriminations. We have this in our law: tying, refusal to deal, predatory pricing. These are example of unilateral conduct. Uh, but take note that unilateral conduct is always associated with market power. Because uh, if you don't have market power, you don't have the dominance, okay, uh, it's unlikely that you'll be able to do this, okay, because otherwise uh, you will lose the market. No? But if you are a dominant position, you can always this, you can always abuse the dominance and using this uh, price discrimination, tying, refusal to deal, predatory pricing and and because of your market power walang option yung uh, uh, ibang party competitor or the uh, those uh, uh, other uh, players in the market okay so those are example of unilateral conduct okay uh, let me proceed now to uh, an overview of the earlier uh, competition regimes in the world okay uh, while it is the uh, the United States antitrust law that is considered the, the, the father of modern antitrust law. Uh, it is actually the U.S. antitrust law that shaped the world competition law. Kung mga, uh, one author, uh, one scholar uh, described uh, uh, the U.S. antitrust law as the, the most successful export product of, of um, uh, the United States. And and uh, not only that, uh, they have also used this uh, uh, during the colonial time. If we will, uh, if if we can, uh, if uh, we go back to to, for example, uh, uh, the case of Japan, where uh, after uh, the defeat of um, Japan to the Allied forces, uh, one of the instruments they use. 
uh, so that Japan would not be able to rebuild its military might was actually the anti-monopoly law uh, in order to disband the Zaibatsu in Japan. So they use that. Not actually for, they say that it's for economic democratization, but the truth of the matter is that uh, the uh, transplantation of the antitrust law to Japan or the anti-monopoly law is more political. And that also happens in the Philippines. When um, the Sherman law was transplanted in the Philippines uh, through, um, uh, what, through uh, 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 the, um, uh, uh, in, in uh, um, let me go back, to where was my slide? Okay, when, uh, um, okay, where, sorry, oh, okay. Let me go back. Okay, so uh, similar also, the same in the Philippines, uh, where it, it was uh, during the colonial time, during the American occupations, that they, they transplanted, they imported uh, the Sherman Law uh, through Act uh, 3247. And this 3247 is almost a copycat of the Sherman Act. Kaya ang tinatawag ko dyan is the Philippine Sherman Act or the Philippine Sherman Law. Pareho lang. But at that time, we don't need that law. But the only purpose why they transplanted that antitrust law in the Philippines was to build a European image. I mean, not European, Western image to our legal system. A United States image to our, Western, to our legal system. So it has a different goal at that time when it was transplanted in, in the Philippines. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, as I've said again, uh, it's not the United States that uh, was the f that became the first modern um, modern um, uh, where where modern um, where is the slide? Oh yeah, um, earlier competition regimes. It is actually the Wallace Act of Canada that widely regarded by. By contemporaries as an M uh, as as the first modern competition law statute, but while it is the first uh, statute, uh, uh, this law was not enforced. No, it, it it was regarded as as an empty political gesture by politicians who had pushed for it. No, in the context of social uh, probably demand. No. Uh, the, the, the act prescribed behavior that unlawfully restricted competition in various ways. However, this amounted to deferring to common law restraint of trade, which allowed most competitions. So the, this uh, Canadian Wallace Act was later on replaced by three subsequent uh, competition law statutes. Then later on, uh, they adopted the, the 1986 Modern Competition Act. Now, I also included here the Spanish Código Penal of 1870 because I discovered that we do have, uh, there are actually three important provisions in the Spanish Código Penal that has a competition law aspect. And that's why I included here as among the earlier competition regimes. Okay, but let's proceed to uh, the U.S. antitrust law and the European Union antitrust law or competition law. And why is this important? Uh, again, uh, we we need to uh, look into this uh, look into this uh, uh, system competition law system because our modern our Philippine Competition Act is uh, modeled or borrowed from uh, the EU and the US uh, competition law. Okay, uh, the, in in the United States, the main uh, these are the main. Um, Antitrust, uh, antitrust law. They have um, um, the Sherman Act, okay, uh, of eighteen ninety. You have a section one of uh, the Sherman Act of eighteen ninety that uh, deals uh, with cartels and market divisions, boycotts, vertical restrictions, uh, typically imposed by an upstream firm. Uh, on downstream firm uh, and then also historically section 1 of the Sherman Act also covers uh, mergers. Uh, section 2 of the Sherman Act uh, 
covers monopolizations or exclusionary practices, which is uh, the counterpart of the abuse of dominant uh, provisions in the EU uh, competition law. They also have uh, the next uh, statute is the Clayton Act of 1914. Uh, this Clayton Act uh, involves uh, something to do with uh, uh, the uh, uh, competitive harmful provisions uh, that often operates to limit suppliers' use of wholesale pricing uh, to make the distribution of its products more efficient under uh, Section 2 of Clayton Act. And then you'll have Clayton Act Section 3 uh, that uh, uh, covers tying and exclusive dealing. Uh, and all other uh, practices uh, prohibited by Clayton Act under Section 3, Section 1 of the Sherman Act, and Section 3 of Clayton Act uh, are quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite similar. So that's why they are uh, a bit uh, superfluous. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, you also have the Federal Trade Commission Act uh, of 1914. In so far as uh, competition in European Union, you, uh, we need to emphasize that it's two layers. You, know, you have the national competition law system because yung mga countries in Europe, in European Union, may mga kanikanilang competition statute. But they have the European Union competition law, which is uh, uh, quite a, it's in the nature of uh, uh, a treaty. Uh, it's a treaty law, so it's it's and under in the context of European Union, it is considered a constitutional law. Uh, so uh, you have uh, your provisions. Um, uh, the Article One Hundred One of the FEU and Article One Hundred Two of the FE of the Treaty of uh, Functioning of European uh, Union. Okay. Uh, Another distinct, important distinction that we need to highlight, uh, United States antitrust law is based on common law. That's why, uh, according to the proponents of the, uh, the Sherman Act, uh, they are not actually, when they pass the Sherman Act, they're not actually passing a new law. But according to the framers of the, the Sherman law, they are merely federalizing the common law concept of restraint of trade. So it's based on common law. While the European Union competition law, it's based on the constitution of European Union. You have the Treaty of uh, TEC, Treaty of European Community. Then it was later on uh, mended by uh, the Treaty of Functioning of European Union. So the competition law of Euro European Union is based on the Treaty of Functioning of European Union. Uh, United States antitrust law based uh, its its standard on consumer welfare. That's why uh, we discussed earlier that uh, in so far as United States antitrust law, the uh, uh, the the goal is consumer welfare, and so they use consumer welfare standard you know, in their analysis. Uh, while in the European Union, uh, it's not just consumer welfare, uh, but it's uh, protecting the internal market, uh, in protecting internal market. It's also important to, and you might be interested, uh, you, you can re do your research, uh, to three, two important school of thoughts or ideologies that have that had also shaped the antitrust law in the United, United States. You have the Harvard School of um, uh, Harvard School, and you have your um, um, your uh, Chicago uh, uh, Chicago School. Um, while in the in the in the case of uh, uh, European Union competition law, uh, it's ordo liberalism. Um, so, what is this? Uh, give you a a very. Uh, uh, broad overview of uh, what is the Chicago School. Uh, well, the Chicago School of Antitrust uh, uh, Law uh, offered an, an, an elegant pro-market. Uh, so this is largely anti-interventionist. The consumer welfare model, the consumer uh, welfare model was first articulated by the uh, the, the right, by the Chicago School writings in 1950s to 1960s. Uh, but this was uh, widely popularized by uh, Robert Bork in in, 1970, in his 1978 book, Antitrust Paradox. So again, when we talk about Chicago School, 
Uh, it's pro-market and it's uh, largely anti-interventionist. Uh, building on new classical economics, Chicago school writers argue that in the long run, markets tend to protect their own imperfections, so lesser uh, uh, in market intervention. On the other hand, uh, when we speak of Harvard School, the Harvard School began in a much different place than the Chicago School, but has diverged much more uh, from its historical roots. Traditionally, Harvard School was heavily struct struct structuralist. So you, Chicago School, uh, uh, anti-interventionist, pro-market, while you have the Harvard School, which is very structuralist, which means that it was apt to view markets as non-competitive whenever they deviated from what they were taught to be basic competitive conditions. So that's uh, uh, your Harvard School. Uh, so, dumapo naman tayo sa European Union. So, uh, in European Union, uh, we have the this uh, school of economics, uh, uh, ordo liberalism. What is this ordo liberalism? Uh, this view, ordo under or this ordo liberal economics, uh, it takes the view that competition law should protect competition as a system. Okay. Uh, and uh, as a as a system, so that is the the uh, conception of um, uh, the ordo uh, ordo liberalism. Okay, so uh, again, uh, you have here the EU versus US substantive antitrust positions that I have discussed. So let me go over it again. You have the Sherman Act Section One, uh, Sherman Act Section Two, Clayton Act Section Two, Clayton Act Section Three, so on and so forth. And you also have your European Union competition law, your Article 101 TFEU on anti-competitive agreements. Uh, I would uh, recommend that you download a copy of the uh, the uh, this Article 101 of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, uh, which provides for the anti-competitive agreement, so you can make a comparison with our with our law because it's important because we borrowed uh, some of the terms in this uh, statute. The concept of by object or by effect was actually borrowed from uh, the text of Article 101 of the Treaty of Function of the European Union. The, uh, that question a while ago also uh, about uh, exception to personal rule uh, is also borrowed from Article 101, that objective justifications uh, involving the bifurcations of Article 101, Article 101, Paragraph 3 of the uh, Treaty of Function of the European Union. You also have the, uh, that Article 102 of the TFEU, which is the abuse of dominance, uh, which is the counterpart of our abuse of dominant position under Section 14 of the Philippine Competition Act. So uh, it's important that you read this because it also provides the list of uh, uh, the, the conducts no? uh, 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 divided into two your exploitative abuses and your exclusionary abuses. And of course, you have your EU merger regulations. The EU merger regulations is not uh, the regulation, the merger regulation in Europe is not based on the Treaty of Functioning of European Union, but through a regulation, you know, the EU merger regulation. Okay, so let me proceed to EU uh, uh, and US analytical framework. Uh, in the United States, they use the per se illegality rule and rule of reason. While in the European Union, they use the restriction by object. So there is a, that object box and there is that effect box. No? So you uh, know, that's that's on our uh, slide. No? Uh, in so far as merger uh, regulation is concerned, uh, they are using substantially listening competition test in the United States, the SLC test, while in the European Union, um, they are using uh, 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 different uh, merger tests. Now you have the substantive test. Uh, some also use SLC, like in the UK. Uh, some use dominant test. And now uh, in the merger uh, uh, regulation reform, they have the significant, uh, the SIEC, significant, significantly impede effective competition test. Okay. In Asia, 
uh, let me skip that one. Now let me proceed to the evolutions of Philippine competition law system. I hope you are still with me, no? Uh, okay ba? Kaway naman kayo dyan? Uh, let me first read the comments. Uh, I hope you are still with me. Uh, sorry if I'm boring. Uh, because, yeah, my subject is very complicated. Okay. Oh, thank you, Commissioner T. Anong blockbuster? Okay, so uh, let me continue. Uh, medyo nag-relax lang tayo ng konti dahil uh, alam nyo na, hindi pa tayo kumakain dahil sa fasting. Uh, okay, so uh, the next uh, slide that we will talk is... Um, Evolutions of Philippine Competition Law. I hope uh, uh, medyo nabigyan ko kayo ng uh, you know, ng uh, konting uh, background on competition law. Uh, I know that medyo mabilis ako because of the, the time I need to cover uh, everything and also uh, uh, the law is complicated. It's a very complex law. So I hope uh, um uh, so let me proceed to uh to the evolutions of philippine competition law system okay i hope you're there okay uh let's proceed to the slide on uh slide number 26 on the, the evolutions of philippine competition law system okay i will discuss three stages of transport Transformation. These are the pre-Philippine uh, Competition Act regime. No? These are the transformations of our Philippine Competition Law System before Congress enacted the Philippine Competition Act. Okay. Again, I would like to emphasize that Philippines is the first in Asia to have a competition law. Okay. That's, that's something that you should remember. So, this law is not new. Competition law or antitrust law, depends on the term, plays also a vital role in the hybridization of our legal system or the union of civil law and common law. So, naging parte yung ating antitrust law. No? It, in fact, it's among the drivers of the, uh, the merger or the union of uh, competition, the union of the civil law uh, tradition and the common law tradition, the Anglo-American uh, 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 common law system. Okay, uh, that's the first stage. The second stage that we're going to discuss is the transplantations of the American laws. No? When the Sherman Law was transplanted, when the Clayton Act was transplanted, this is not known to many, but uh, uh, the provisions of the Clayton on merger regulations was earlier transplanted in the Philippines. That is why the concept substantially listening competition is not new in the Philippines. It's been there. It has been uh, there in the old Corporation Act, but uh, the revisions tinanggal. So it's not new. Uh, uh, we have that. So, nothing is new actually to the Philippines. Then, the next aspect is the modernizations of the Penal Code. The modernization of the Penal Code plays a vital role here uh, for the under uh, development of competition law because uh, they transformed this very special, unique uh, law to our penal system that became a, a felony. And then, the next stage is the constitutionalization process, which is also very unique in the Philippines because we are the only country in Asia also that uh, that placed competition law to uh, a higher standard. It is a constitutional norm, which is quite similar to the European treatment of competition law because it's uh, based on the Constitution of the European Union, which is the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. Okay, so let's start with, uh, uh, very quickly, uh, 1565 to 1898, that's the Spanish period occupations. Uh, we have uh, the Penal Code uh, based on the uh, Spanish uh, uh, Código Penal of 1887. Uh, up 
to 1880s and then we have uh, the uh, penal code of 1887 uh, which was uh, uh, made adopted implemented in the philippines uh, on july 14 1887 Okay, so under uh, this penal code, uh, you have there the penal code relevant provisions. You can just read this article. You have Article 542, Article 543, and Article 544. Uh, these are based on, uh, taken from the uh, uh, old old uh, penal code, not in the revised penal code. Uh, what are these relevant provisions? I hope you please uh, read the, the, it's on the slide. Uh, uh, Article uh, 542 makes it a crime for a person to solicit any gift or promises as a consideration for agreeing to refrain from taking part in auction, uh, public auction. So this is a sort of uh, uh, a public, a, a, a different concept of public auction or bidding, uh, a special form of bidding uh, uh, regulated under Article 542, which is it has a competition uh, law element. Uh, Article uh, 543 talks about uh, combinations for the purpose of lowering the conditions of labor. Uh, and then you have Article 544, uh, which uh, involves spreading false rumors, etc., etc. So take note uh, that the act falling under Article 542 to 544 uh, would clearly be an agreement in restraint of trade, and therefore they are competition law statutes. Uh, why are we discussing this? Because you will note later on that these are uh, connected together. You know, uh, the penal code, the revised penal code, and then the uh, uh, Philippine constitutions uh, in building our competition law uh, uh, system. Okay, so let me proceed to the marriage of uh, civil law and common law traditions very quickly. Uh, yes, um, we uh, it is uh, if you look into uh, I, may I call your attention to the case of Alzua versus Johnson's Henry Shoup and United States versus Abiog. Uh, these are important provision decisions of the court that recognizes uh, the existence of a Philippine uh, common common law. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't have to uh, read uh, the highlights of these cases because we are running out of time, but uh, it might be interesting for you to uh, read you know, the text of Alzoa, Andre Soup, and United States versus Abiyok. It's very, very interesting uh, of cases. Okay, but ignore class that the, in the entry of American laws and common law principles uh, in the Philippines, after the transfer of sovereignty from uh, the, the the Spanish occupation to the American occupation, you would normally expect that uh, well, uh, under our under our uh, during the the, the Spanish occupations, uh, mainly we are uh, using civil law uh, traditions. You might expect that the, the coming of the Americans they might abrogate everything and replace it with a common law tradition. That that's not the case. What had happened was that the entry of American laws and common law principles did not supplant, but it rather supplement the major laws left by the Spaniards. So, kaya nagkaroon ng uh, union of the common law and civil laws, we will uh, uh, discover. Okay, a very important part of this union is the common law contract in restraint of trade. Because this term is still existing and uh, the fundamental basis of our antitrust law now as it is being uh, articulated in our uh, constitutions and in, in several uh, jurisprudence. So what is this common law contract in restraint of trade? We don't have this. We don't have this in our civil code. Uh, normally, if a contract uh, during that when, when we... Uh, the dominant view was uh, uh, when when we don't still have the this uh, concept of restraint of trade, when a contract is entered into and it is deemed um, in violations uh, with uh, the law, the the provision that's going to be used is the civil code. But what happened is when uh, the uh, the Americans 
started to to shape our jurisprudence they 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 started using this concept instead of using uh, civil code provisions they they used uh, this uh, this concept of uh, restraint of uh, trade and that's the beginning of uh, the uh, uh, the common law uh, principles shaping the Philippine jurisprudence at the, during the under the time during the time of the um, uh, uh, the American uh, occupations. So, what is this common law contract in restraint of trade? Under common law, a contract in restraint of trade embraced agreements restricting a party from engaging in a particular trade or occupation, or restricting the time, place, or manner in which the trade could or occupation could be engaged. So that is the definitions of uh, contract and restraint of trade. The earliest reported case uh, of this common law contract of restraint of trade was in 1414, which involved a case uh, where the defendant was uh, restricted from engaging in trade of dying in particular location for a prescribed uh, period of time. The court of England, the court of English, the English court, uh, because this was in, 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 in common law uh, jurisprudence, condemned the restrictions as contract in restraint of trade. That was the first, uh, the first uh, 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 reported case, the John Dyer case uh, of uh, contract in restraint of trade, and this was followed by the more popular Michel uh, versus Reynolds in 1711. Uh, this is the most uh, famous common law uh, restraint of trade case. Uh, this case was uh, an action of debt upon a bond enforcing a baker's covenant incident uh, to sale of his bakery. The plaintiff in this case uh, had entered a contract to lease a bakehouse for a period of years on the condition that the lesser, also a baker himself, would refrain from engaging in the bickery business for the term of lease, which is five years. In short, the defendant had promised not to compete for that period, and uh, uh, as uh, as uh, also held in the dire case, the court held that such stipulation, which is ancillary to a valid transaction, was unenforceable because it is a contract in restraint of trade. Now, what is the relevance of these uh, concepts? Now, if you will uh, look into uh, the case that I have uh, cited uh, in the slide, uh, the case of Ferrazine versus Giselle in, uh, in 1916 and, in, and that of Olindorf in 1918, please read the two cases because they are very important. Um, it, they, it, the two cases are quite similar to the discussions in the Dyer and in the Michel case, where in this particular case, you will see how the court used common law principles of uh, restraint of trade uh, and make that comparison of the uh, Odin public and the public policy concept and saying that, uh, well, there is no distinction between common law and civil law. Uh, uh, so please uh, look into uh, the, the case of Ferrazzini and, and, and Olindorf. But very briefly, in sum, Ferrazzini and Olindorf uh, illustrated the Philippine common law contract in restraint of trade as though developed in the context of the marriage of civil law and common law. Okay, let me uh, move faster. Uh, transplanting the Sherman Act. This is very important. Again and again, as I've said earlier, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Sherman Act of the United States was transplanted in the Philippines in December 1, 1925 uh, under your uh, Act Number 3247, otherwise known as an, an, an Act to Prohibit Monopolies and Combination in Restraint of Trade. Now, if you're going to make a comparison of the, these provision and that of the Sherman Act, almost similar. Napaka identical. Even the provisions. Uh, the provisions in both laws, the Sherman Act of the United States and this Act number 3247 um, uh, 
uh, talks about contract combination or conspiracy and they are uh, all uh, in in broad vague language but uh, this uh, uh, law uh, was later on replaced by the revised penal code no uh, when the penal code was uh, revised uh, was modernized uh, that lead to the revised penal code uh, one of the uh, one of the amendment one of the revision that uh, the penal code did was to incorporate act 3247 in the revised penal code so what they did is that they tried to merge uh, it's on the slide no uh, I will not discuss about the feature of the revised penal code if you pr immediately proceed to act, uh, article 186 of the revised penal you will note in in the in the in the um, in the slide the uh, uh, the development that uh, the evolutions of Act Three Two Four Seven to Act One Eighty Six. Okay, so obviously uh, the uh, most of the the elements in Act Three Two Four Seven was incorporated in uh, Article One Eighty Six of the Revised Penal Code. Article 186 of the Revised Penal Code was our oldest competition laws uh, that became also the basis of uh, the provisions of the 1973 Constitution and the 1987 Constitutions. Okay. Uh, let me proceed to the constitutional constitutionalization process. Uh, as I have mentioned earlier, uh, one of the important aspects of competition, the history of the Philippine competition law is its evolution into a constitutional norm. That is why I, I did uh, argue that uh, the cease and desist order may be considered a violation of competition policy because uh, the concept of competition law in the Philippines is now considered a constitutional norm. It is not just merely statutory. If you're going to read it in the context of the uh, art uh, of the 1987 constitutions, so constitutionalization price. Again, I'd like to emphasize uh, we are unique in Asia because our we do have a constitutional provisions on competition law. So where did we get these provisions? The provisions of uh, the first uh, uh, provisions uh, was Section 2 of Article 14 of the 1973 Constitutions uh, that was cited in the Gokongwe case. Uh, then later on, this was uh, uh, carried to the 1987 Constitution under Section, uh, not that's not Section 10, I'm sorry, no, that's Section 19. No, I'd like to correct that one. That's again. A typo even on my tweet. That's section 19 of article 12 of the 1987 constitution. Okay. Um, um, so please correct that uh, slide no, on slide 38. Uh, that was similar to the 1973 constitution. Only that uh, in the 1973 constitution, it only talks about private monopoly. But in the 1987 Constitution, it included uh, public uh, uh, monopolies. Uh, and you will note that the, the, the 1987 Constitution used the standard of uh, public interest. Now, let me read the provisions because it's very important of the 1987 Constitutions. Section 10 of Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution provides the state shall regulate regulate or prohibit monopolies when public interest so requires now let's proceed to the second sentence because it's very important no combinations in restraint of trade or unfair competition shall be allowed so it's an it's if you're going to read the the text it's it's almost absolute uh in fact um uh, the earlier interpretations of the U.S. court uh, of the Sherman Law, which this provision was derived, uh, was also quite a literal interpretation. Uh, that it would appear that almost all combinations in restraint of trade, all form of agreements would be illegal if it would constitute restraint of trade. 
Uh, okay. So why is this important? Why do we talk about the revised penal code? Why do we talk about Act 3247? Why do we talk about uh, com uh, uh, combination of strain of trade? When we have a new law, you might be asking me that uh, you might be wondering that oh, sinayang ni Dindi Tokala ni yung oras natin nakinig sa mga repealed na batas. No, it's not. It is because this is what's unique. It, uh, the provisions of the constitutions are derived from the Article 186. So notwithstanding the fact that the, the revised penal code Article 186 was repealed by the provisions of uh, 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 Philippine Competition Act or uh, Republic Act 10667, they remain relevant because they are part, they are transformed into a this concept where translated into a constitutional norm. And so, according to, if you will look into uh, the deliberations of uh, uh, the members of the commission, uh, uh, Constitutional Commission, uh, Section 19 of uh, Article 12 of the 1987 Constitution, similar also with that uh, uh, separate provision on uh, on uh, commercial uh, mass media, is to be interpreted, this is the language, is to be interpreted in the context of antitrust legislations or jurisprudence on antitrust legislations. And it has to be read in the context of the revised penal code. In fact, it was asked during the deliberations whether uh, the, 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 the commission, the constitutional commission was actually building a different uh, a meaning, different interpretations of the, the phrase like monopolies, combinations of trade, enriching of trade, and unfair competition. The answer of the proponent was that no. These, uh, these terms are to be read uh, as used in the Revised Penal Code. So that is why, notwithstanding the repeal of the Revised Penal Code of Article 186 uh, and also the historical development of uh, uh, restraint of, um, of trade, it's still important because of uh, these constitutional provisions. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, Tatad uh, versus Secretary of uh, Department of Energy uh, uh, said it beautifully. Section 19 of Article 12 of our Constitution is antitrust in history and in spirit. So, I think that, uh, uh, that sums it all. You can read that case. Now, uh, I have for the 30 minutes, I will try to discuss the Philippine Competition Act. Okay. Kaya pa, pahinga mo na ako. Okay. Woo. Fight. Fighting. Fighting. Okay na? Okay kayo dyan? So, pahinga mo na ako ng one minute. And then, uh, we will talk about the, the Philippine Competition Act. So, we're done with uh, the general principles. We're done with a brief overview of the EU and the US competition law system, which... Um, is very important, as I've said, because you will later on discover uh, do natin kinopia yung ating batas. Then we also talk about uh, a very brief uh, historical development of competition law system from uh, uh, begin with its colonial uh, importance as a colonial implant, then uh, how it played of its role in the hybridization of our legal system, the uh, marriage of civil and common law, and how uh, also common law was transplanted in the Philippines, and then uh, the process of the modernizations of our device, of our penal code, and then finally to the constitutionalization process of our competition law or our antitrust law. So let me begin with the uh, uh, Philippine Competition Act. I hope you are still with me. Okay, so please bear with me. Okay, uh, Philippine Competition Act. Um, the Philippine Competition Act, the Republic Act 10667, is the oldest pending bill in Congress. The oldest pending bill. It took uh, Congress to pass this law for uh, about 25 years. It's 25 years in the making. 
Uh, it is viewed uh, by by the government, by the Philippine competition, as a game changer. But again, it's a game changer, but it's not new. Uh, according to the chairman of the Philippine Competition Commission, it's a step in the right direction. I, and I certainly do agree with the observations of the, the chairman of uh, the, the, the Philippine Competition Commission. Uh, but if you're going to read what motivated Congress to pass this law was... Uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, was uh, its commitment to to uh, the ASEAN economic uh, integration. Okay, uh, this law was signed into law in, in on July twenty one two thousand fifteen, and it took effect on August eight two thousand fifteen. In a nutshell, the Philippine Competition Act mandates the creation of a national competition authority, which was actually lacking. One, my 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 thesis argues that uh, one of the factors that really contributed to the uh, an enforcement of the Philippine competition of the antitrust law then under the revised penal code was the lack of a counterpart of the antitrust division of the United States. In fact, only in 2011, where when the government realized that ah oh, we need to come up with with a, a special uh, uh, division of the Department of Justice, the Office for Competition, but it was too late. But anyway, we have now this modern law. Okay, uh, so what are the motivations for its enactment? Uh, according, if you to the uh, the the um, uh, records of uh, uh, this this law, the congressional records, uh, uh, the there's a need to consolidate the the numerous fragmented and scattered competition law stages. That was uh, the one of the the motivations of uh, our Congress. There's need to have a specific central body, and that is the Philippine competition. It's a commitment to ASEAN economic integrations, and also uh, provides for. Uh, they also argued on so many uh, on other aspect of uh, the uh, the uh, uh, what is it? Sorry, the uh, um, uh, non-economic uh, aspect of uh, non-economic goal of our. Uh, Philippine uh, competition, and if I may articulate uh, uh, in the uh, uh, records, um, the draft, the bills passed in Congress uh, uh, among the the motivations was uh, uh, talks about the broader economic and non-economic goals that as to level the playing field for business, to allow more uh, Filipinos to exercise entrepreneurial spirit, to encourage competition, innovation, to assure investment, economic development. And to help eradicate poverty, it's very unique, no? Uh, because we do have this even social goal in our in our competition law. Okay, so uh, we have the important substantive liability provisions. Uh, you have section fourteen. We've been mentioning that one. Your anti-competitive agreements. Then section fifteen, the abuse of dominant position, and then your section twenty, your prohibited mergers or acquisitions. Okay, um, so what? Do we have what on on section uh, uh, fourteen the anti competitive agreements? Uh, important ito because it's going to be part of the itong aspect na to yung sinama sa syllabus. So let me uh, please uh, uh, get your slide on anti competitive agreements. Uh, slide number uh, uh, forty five. Horizontal uh, our section fourteen is divided into three parts. Your paragraph one, paragraph A of section article section fourteen speaks of horizontal policy agreements. Now your price fixing and your bid rigging. Price fixing. This is your restricting competition as to price or components thereof or other terms of trade. So this is under the per se violations. In other words, it's uh, illegal per se. The mere existence of the agreement will render those competitors involved liable, criminally, administratively, and civilly. No. So that is your horizontal per se agreement. Take note that section 14 applies only to competitors. That's why it speaks of horizontal per se agreements. Second paragraph, paragraph B. And so what's the element of this one? The element of uh, 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 element of uh, section 14 
There is a horizontal agreement. The parties are competitors. The purpose or object of the agreement is to fix or rig a competitive bidding. Okay, next paragraph, your section 14, paragraph B, uh, is your product limitations and your market divisions. But what's interesting in this provision is that there is a combination of the U.S. and the uh, um, European uh, 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 Union competition law on object or effect. It speaks of, if I may read, the following agreements between or among competitors which have the object or effect of substantially preventing, restricting, or lessening competition shall be prohibited. Uh, but according to the, the deliberations of uh, Congress, uh, this section is going to be the counterpart of the rule of reason. So in other words, section 14 will be evaluated under the rule of reason analysis. The court will have to look into uh, the pro-competitive or anti-competitive effect of this agreement. But, but, uh, this is interesting because under EU law and under the U.S. Uh, antitrust law, this uh, uh, paragraph B is considered under the object box, which is the counterpart of the per se rule in the United States. Okay. And like, what is an agreement? It's important also. Uh, so let's proceed to section, paragraph, other agreements. Again, please correct the slide. That's supposed to be other agreements, section 14, paragraph C. No, that is your rule of reason with objective justifications uh, that provides this. So other ag uh, agreements other than those specified in paragraph A and B of this section which have the object or effect of substantially preventing, restricting, or lessening competition shall be prohibited. So this speaks of those not included under restricting, under price fixing, uh, bid rigging, market allocation, uh, uh, market divisions, or uh, uh, and also vertical agreements are covered by paragraph C. But this uh, section is subject to objective justification, uh, which is uh, also the uh, which was borrowed from uh, uh, Article One Hundred One, Paragraph Three of uh, Treaty of Functioning of European Union. Okay, so again, uh, you have Paragraph A, B, and C. So please correct the slides on slide forty-seven. Okay, let me proceed to, so what is an agreement? So it's important that you also look into the agreement definitions. Take note that the agreement definitions under the Philippine competition is very, very broad. Uh, the definition speaks of any type or form of contract, arrangement, understanding, collective recommendation, or concerted action, whether formal or informal, explicit or tacit, written or oral. So this that definitions under section uh, uh, under uh, Section 4B uh, should be read in conjunction with the meaning of agreements under Section 14. So, kaya importante yun. Okay. So, let's see how this, uh, this hybridization. I have here uh, the figure that illustrate uh, the uh, fusion of the European and U.S. law. Uh, you have this uh, Persian rule and in Article uh, 101, the object or effect and then you have you know how this law was transformed into a uh, tripartite uh, a form no because in the philippines you have per se you also have the per se plus object plus effect plus the slc no uh and then so on and so forth and then uh, the next slide also that also illustrate the reasons why nagkaroon ng ganitong model which is very complicated well because the uh, because of the versions magkaiba yung version ng senado at saka uh, you know uh, uh, house and so that resulted to these hybridizations so what happened what happened uh, based on the bicameral committee conference they tried to reconcile uh, uh, the versions of house bill 5286 and senate bill 2282 uh, and then they come up with this distribution so you have the per se section 14a uh, 
Object Effect Plus SLC Section 14B, which is the rule of reason or the understanding of rule of reason, which is quite the opposite because object is never the, the counterpart of, of rule of reasons in the context of European law. Uh, and then you have the object plus effect SLC and any objective justification. But anyway, just leave it that way. You know, that is uh, uh, your provision. So it was asked in the syllabus, San ba yung object, uh, rule of reason? Rule of reason analysis placed in your uh, section 14B and section 14C plus the objective justifications. While section 14A uh, speaks of uh, per se uh, rule. Okay, what is the effect of entering into anti-competitive agreement? Well, the contract is deemed void. Parties involved are to be subjected to uh, administrative sanction, criminal prosecution, and private actions. Uh, uh, and take note that uh, it is enough that they, they agreed to, uh, to fix the price. They agreed to uh, divide the market. It is, uh, it does, it, the law does not require that they have really uh, executed the agreement, okay? Uh, because what is prohibited here is uh, the, the entering of uh, uh, this form of agreements. Because you don't evaluate in the context of uh, per se rule, uh, you don't evaluate the effect of this agreement because they are considered on its form uh, uh, illegal no? under... Uh, section uh, paragraph 14 paragraph 8 now that with respect to price uh, fixing but in the context of market divisions uh, under Philippine law not in the United States or in the EU law but under Philippine law the existence of a contract is not enough because the law requires that uh, 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 the, the law requires that uh, it must substantially prevent uh, uh, or lessen con uh, uh, competition in the market. So it involves rule of reason. There's a need to to balance, uh, to evaluate whether it has anti-competitive or pro-competitive effect. So I hope that's clear. Now, the first, uh, we have a first insurance section 40, uh, 14 case, the insurance pool case. Uh, this is, this. I will not discuss the merit of this case because this is now pending in, in, in the Philippine Competition Commission, the insurance pool case. Uh, uh, the charge was on section 14 paragraph C. Let me proceed to abuse of dominant positions. Oh, I have only 10 minutes. Abuse of dominant position, uh, we need to uh, take note class that, uh, take note ladies and gentlemen, that uh, what is illegal is not uh, that dominant position, having that market power is not illegal. What is being prohibited by law is that abuse of dominance for the firm to EU to exercise to out, uh, that conduct that constitute exclusionary or exploitative. Yun ang pinagbabawal ng section 15. No? So in other words, bigness per se is not illegal. What is illegal is for that uh, uh, entity or undertaking that has a market power at least 50%, that's the rebuttable presumption that one is a dominant player in the market. So what's being prohibited by law is uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the conduct. Okay, uh, so there are four ways to think about market power as an ability to increase price, as commercial power, the ability to exclude rivals, and then as a formal uh, jurisdictional test. So those are the way how you think of market power because uh, con the conceptualizations of market power is essential in competition law. Okay, so I listed here the abuse box under section 15, no? Yan yung mga nakalagay dyan. Under the law, this is, this list is exclusive. This list is exclusive. But under the implementing rules and regulations, according to the implementing rules, it's non-exclusive. But I, my view is that no, this is exclusive. The original draft uh, was that these lists are not exclusive but later on during the bicameral committee conference they removed because they want that the listing should be exclusive so uh, uh, I, I don't uh, agree with the implementing rules my view is that these are um, these are uh, the only list these are the only uh, uh, ab abusive conducts under section 15 uh, Okay, so 
Uh, just take note, pre predatory pricing, imposing barriers to entry, bundling or tying, price discriminations, restrictive vertical agreements, resale price maintenance, refusal to deal, exclusive arrangement, imposing unfair price, limiting production. But take note, only a player, only the, an entity that has a market power can be subjected to this provision because it speaks of abuse of dominant position. Even if, if you don't have that dominance, that market power, and you are doing predatory pricing, then you will not be liable because, uh, well, normally uh, you will not have the capacity to sustain such, such uh, exclusionary or exploitative conduct. Okay, so that is insofar as this abuse or abusive conduct box. Uh, yeah, uh, it's there. Now, role of intent. Um, intent under our law is, my view, is important in the determinations of whether one is liable for abusive conduct. Why? Uh, uh, although uh, this is debatable under European law, which we borrowed this section 14, uh, but there is a distinction under the uh, under the uh, uh, EU law. It's uh, they they it's under objective test. But if you no, note, if you will look into the provisions of Section 15, it added an SLC test, and therefore that would require therefore uh, the, for an effect based analysis. And so uh, role so intent is uh, is going to be essential uh, that is my view uh, in determining whether uh, uh, a dominant player uh, is liable for abuse of dominant position okay so under uh, what are the standard of analysis uh, it's important the standard of analysis and the competitive agreements you have the Prussia rule object plus slc that's the rule of reason uh, then your object effect plus SLC object justification or rule of reason. Abuse of dominant position, you have your conduct plus SLC or rule of reason. Take note that rule of reason was never mentioned in the law, although it's being uh, discussed during the deliberation of the House. They've been referring uh, 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 to, uh, to, to the rule of reason, although, although not correctly, uh, but we have to leave it to, to the statute. I mean, that's how they uh, formulated uh, the law. Uh, so, uh, uh, rule of reason is equivalent to conduct plus SLC. What is also unique in our abusive conduct provision, our abusive dominant position, was the fact that we included an objective justification, you know, which is also uh, present in anti-competitive agreement, which are not present in in the... Uh, in, um, in uh, the European law. So, in Article 1 or 2 of the FEU. So, what happened in the abuse of dominant position? This is the process. Well, of course, after doing the market definitions, because that's in, in part a uh, relevant market, then uh, uh, you have to, to determine whether the, the conduct of the dominant player falls under the object box. Kasama ba dun sa listing natin? And after that, you may also ask whether whether the objective justifications will apply, no? Uh, whether it has a uh, which is uh, provided under uh, 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 section uh, fifteen, no? Okay, but uh, there is somehow. Uh, let me uh, if. But take note of section twenty six. Section 26, uh, which is, to me, that blurred the characterizations that we discussed under uh, Article uh, 14 and 15, because Section 26 provides that it did make it did not make any distinctions uh, under uh, Section 26, which is your uh, rule on the determinations of anti-competitive agreement or conduct. Uh, to me, this was. Uh, not totally correct, uh, but uh, there was a mistake uh, in the final drafting of these provisions uh, because it, to me, what the problem is that it created that, uh, you know, that 
uh, it created a situation where there is a conflict between uh, the characterization under section 14 and and this section 26 because under section 26 it would appear that all anti-competitive agreements all abusive dominant positions are subject to an elaborate rule of reason analysis that's the problem so we have to wait for uh, how the Philippine Competition Commission, eventually the court, and how the court and uh, the PCC will reconcile uh, uh, the uh, the this paradox no, of uh, Section 14 and that of Section 26. Okay, so relevant market definition is important. When we talk about market definition, we talk about market substitutability. So just to read... Uh, uh, section 24 on market uh, uh, definition because it's important uh, uh, that before you can even apply determine whether uh, whether uh, 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 a whether uh, an entity is liable for an abusive uh, conduct or exclusionary conduct you must first evaluate uh, whether uh, uh, he has a market power and uh, doing that you need first to define the market define the market uh, the relevant product market the relevant geographical market and so uh, among practitioners if you are for the uh, the complainant then you will try to define uh, 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 the market in a broader uh, uh, way but if you are on the defendant you will try to narrow down your definition so that you, uh, it will appear that uh, uh, the the conduct does not fall within the relevant uh, market. Okay, so what is substantially preventing, restricting, or lessening competition? It's very important because this phrase was uh, mentioned in all the antitrust liability provisions. Uh, it is listed in your section 14 B and C. It is part of your abuse of dominance and it is part of your prohibited mergers and this you know made even more complicated our standard of analysis because slc is used in merger regulations and not in abuse of dominance uh, 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 provisions and not on anti-competitive agreements because iba ang standard of analysis but unfortunately uh, it's it's in the law no kaya nga sabi ko dahil part of the fusion Okay, so the first uh, abuse of dominant case, and I think you might have heard this, was the Orban Dica Home Manila Condominium Corporations, um, where in uh, this case, uh, the PCC uh, uh, filed uh, a, a case of, uh, uh, a case of uh, exclusive dealing, uh, but this uh, was not, uh, uh, but this case uh, was, uh, uh, didn't, uh, was not uh, decided on the merit because uh, eventually the uh, Orban Dica Homes did not challenge the statement of objections but rather it entered into a um, uh, a settlement and uh, it paid a fine of 27.11 million. Okay, section 14 and 26 paradox as I've said again there is a distinction but the internal, rev uh, internal revenue inter uh, the IRR tried to correct the uh, the seemingly contradiction of section 26 and section 14 and in the IRR it speaks of for for appropriate cases for appropriate cases which i think uh, right and logical that the philippine competition commission has included uh, has added the phrase for appropriate cases but if you're going to read the statute it would appear that it did not make any distinction uh, but we have uh, here the, uh, the IRR that try to correct that paradox of Section 14 and Section uh, 26. Okay, let me proceed to the merger and acquisitions. Okay, merger and acquisition. Um, anyway, uh, uh, our live uh, is only up to 4.30, but I'll, uh, I'll if, if I can... Um, We'll try to finish this um, up until 5 p.m. No? If, if uh, those who, who can still uh, uh, stay with me. Uh, uh, but anyway, this is going to be recorded. Uh, uh, and then you can just play it uh, later on. So I'll just finish everything. No, I, I have a few remaining slides so I can cover mergers and institutional makeup of the Philippine Competition Act. 
Okay, let me proceed to merger and acquisition. Of course, you know what is a merger and what acquisition is. When we talk here of horizontal merger, is a merger of entities whose product or services directly compete in the same market. Yun ang pinaka tiniting nano that the merger that is covered by the merger regulation are those merger horizontal merger of entity whose products or services directly compete in the same market. We also have a non-horizontal merger, which can either be vertical merger or a conglomerate merger. Okay, a vertical uh, a merger involves entities operating in different uh, levels of production chain, product uh, production supply chain. That is, uh, suppliers or customers of, of one another. So, for example, here you have the downstream and your upstream firm uh, merging. You know? uh, and also a case of conglomerate. Okay, so what is important in the merger regulations for the purpose of the bar examinations, I think? Is your compulsory regime, your compulsory notification requirement under Section 17. Okay, tingnan yung Section 17. What is in... In these uh, 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 provisions, uh, under Section 17, it requires a parties to a merger or acquisition to notify the Philippine competition before they can consummate the merger or acquisition. Now, I pointed out that uh, this was overlooked by the revisions of the corporation code, the, the latest revisions. It, it failed to consider these existing provisions because the final approval of a merger acquisitions, when it falls under the compulsory, it's going to be the PCC because a merger or acquisition, when it falls in the threshold requirement, will be considered void ab initio. Even if it's approved by the, the, uh, the uh, Security and Exchange Commission. It is going to be void and uh, the parties will be subject to a huge administrative fine. Okay, so let me, what is this section 17? Compulsory notification requirement. If it reaches that threshold requirement, uh, in the law, by the way, ah, baka, uh, you might uh, be confused. In sex, under Section 17, it speaks of the threshold, speaks of 1 billion. Okay? Uh, the value of transaction exceeds 1 billion. In other words, if the value exceeds that, it's going to be subject to mandatory compulsory notification. But that was revised twice already by the Philippine Competition Commission because the law allows the PCC to uh, to uh, adjust the threshold. Pwede nilang babaan, pwede nilang taasan. It depends on the market conditions of the Philippines. And because to their mind that uh, there's a need to adjust the threshold kasi dumadaming pumapasok sa kanila na the merger review. No? Di na nila makaya and I think our also market is to this big uh, and that the threshold 1 million is too small. So they, they've, they've, um, they've increased the, compo the threshold. And now, very recently, they have again increased the threshold. So this is the threshold. Uh, the threshold is 5 million, uh, uh, 5 billion, 500, 5, uh, 5.6 billion for size of person, 2.2 billion for size of transaction. Okay. If the, if the merger or acquisition met that threshold requirement, they cannot enter into a, um, uh, they cannot consummate the merger. Upon reaching a definitive agreement, they have to notify the Philippine Competition Commission. And they cannot consummate that within a period of 30 days. That's the 30-day uh, waiting period of a notifications. If, if the, the merger or acquisition, the parties has cons consummated uh, the merger or acquisitions and 
the transaction falls within the threshold, uh, that will be considered void ab initio. And the uh, 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 merging parties uh, will be uh, subjected to a fine of 1% to 10 to 5% of the value of transaction. It's a very huge, okay? It's very huge. Uh, uh, it's very huge. Uh, even if uh, such uh, uh, merger or acquisition does not lessen competition in the market, what is being punished here by the law is the failure to notify the Philippine Competition Commission because we've adopted a pre not pre merger notification regime. Okay. The first important case that was decided by this by the Philippine Competition Commission, and you might be interested to read uh, the decision is available uh, in the internet, is the Odina Corporation. In this particular case, then take note that the only involved in this case is Odina failed to notify the Philippine Competition Commission. And so uh, uh, upon evaluations, the transaction uh, 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 satisfies the size of transaction test and therefore uh, they should have notified the PCC before consummating the uh, 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 consummating the um, uh, what is it before consummating the the, the merger. Uh, and so, uh, uh, a complaint was lodged to the PCC. The PCC uh, 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 conducted the motor proof investigations, and it found out that yes, there was really no, uh, there was really no uh, notifications. And so, uh, uh, the the PCC uh, find uh, voided the uh, mer the merger, and then uh, find um, um, subjected uh, the respondent. Odinia Corporation and KGL to an amount of 19,667,175.9, which is 1% of the value of transactions. Uh, there was, uh, uh, the, this, this, is not a, this is not a unanimous decision because one of the commissioners uh, uh, dissented, uh, argues that, argued that uh, the commission uh, should have uh, used uh, his forbearance uh, power uh, and took into account this is a first case uh, but the, the majority of the commission uh, agreed that no the law does not allow any exception and therefore and it does not also empower the Philippine Competition Commission to 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 uh, exempt uh, or forbear uh, a, a violator but uh, given that uh, this is uh, the first time uh, the the court uh, did I mean the PCC did uh, mitigate the penalty to into just one uh, percent of the value of transaction, but it's still huge. No, imagine it's nineteen million. Oh my God! Okay, the next case is the grab over case, you no, know, which I think you all familiar. In this particular case, there was no notification in the case of grab over case. Why? Because after evaluations, the transaction cost uh, uh, does not uh, did not rather breach the uh, threshold, and so uh, what happened in this case, uh, uh, the Philippine Competition uh, uh, filed a motor proprio, um, uh, conducted a motor proprio uh, uh, investigations, and then the merger uh, and acquisition office found that there is indeed a, an SLC you know, uh, uh, effect of the acquisition of grab over over but eventually uh, the the investigations uh, was terminated because grab filed the request for voluntary commitments and then a decision um, was uh, issued by uh, the pcc uh, allowing the uh, voluntary commitment of uh, the um, uh, of uh, of uh, what is it of um, uh, grab uh, and so uh, it listed several uh, 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 conditions. And you will note that uh, uh, there have been instances uh, uh, very recently wherein uh, Grab was fined by the Philippine Competition Commission for violating the, the, uh, the uh, conditions of uh, the, um, um, what is it, the conditions of um, uh, the uh, voluntary commitment. Okay, for merger review, there are two phases of merger review. You have your first phase, which is 
uh, it takes uh, uh, review takes for a mi maximum period of 30 days from complete notification or oh, and payment. Uh, this involves uh, assessment to determine if the notified merger raises competition uh, concern that would warrant comprehensive review. If it does warrant, then the uh, merger and acquisition uh, uh, office uh, proceed to the phase two, which is a more detailed and in-depth assessment uh, within a period of 60 days. What is the effect? If no SLC, the merger and acquisition is cleared. If with SLC, either the PCC will prohibit the merger and acquisition or prohibit the merger and acquisition and directs the parties to modify, change the, the arrangement to avoid the, that uh, uh, effect of having uh, uh, SLC, or totally uh, prohibit the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, merger and acquisition unless and until the pertinent party or parties enter into a legally enforceable agreement specified by the Philippine Competition Commission. Okay, so a very uh, four remaining slides. Uh, PCC's enforcement regime. Uh, you will note that uh, the powers of functions of Philippine competition it does function does quasi legislative and quasi judicial nature uh, because it has the power to enact rules, uh, guidelines, etc., etc. It and of course it is a quasi judicial body, um, and as such it. Uh, does have a, 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 a tripartite role as an investigator, prosecutor, and as an administrative judge. Uh, the PCC has also original and primary jurisdiction over all competition law matters. Okay, procedural characteristic. You have uh, uh, three adjudicative functions of the PCC. You have the power to determine anti-competitive agreements and conduct, power to of preliminary inquiry, which is a uh, requirement for criminal prosecution and, and civil actions. Power to review merger and acquisitions. So again, the three stages of uh, the enforcement, preliminary inquiry, full investigations, and then adjudications. In the case of filing for a case before the PCC, it's enough that you have a consumer standing. Now you can file. Cases decided by the PCC subject to review of the uh, of the court of appeals under rule 43 okay under the law uh, the office for competition uh, uh, still functions as as uh, the proper forum for criminal action but take note that unlike the antitrust divisions of the united states the uh, office for competition uh, cannot cannot initiate a preliminary investigation until uh, such time that the uh, under the Philippine Competition Act okay until such time that uh, until such time that um, um, uh, what is it that the um, uh, uh, the PCC had uh, done its uh, preliminary inquiry but that is in so far as section 14a and section 14b but as to other other stages like the price act the Price Act, the criminal prosecution, and even under the Bayanihan Law, which is an antitrust statute, will not have to pass through the Philippine Competition Commission because they are not subject to preliminary inquiry. I'd, again, I'd like to repeat, only Section 14A and Section 14B is subject to preliminary inquiry before a party can file a case to the uh, the Department of Justice. In other cases, uh, the uh, the Office for Competition can initiate a preliminary investigations. And uh, uh, finally, for private enforcement, for private enforcement, uh, again, uh, it is not the same with that of the uh, private uh, enforcement in the United States. Private enforcement under Section Forty Five is subject to preliminary inquiry. Therefore, you cannot uh, file a, a, a suit directly to, to the court uh, until such time that the, uh, the PCC had done its preliminary inquiry. Okay, so who can file a private action under Section 45? Only those persons directly injured by the anti-competitive conduct or anti-competitive agreements or uh, the prohibited merger can file a private actions. So that ends my presentations. But if you are interested, ladies and gentlemen, oh my goodness, 
you can read. Uh, I have listed there as suggested readings. You can download them. Uh, uh, the link is there. Uh, you can uh, you may visit ssrn.com. Uh, I've uploaded uh, there two articles that are relevant. The Philippine Competition Act, a mestiza that explores the hybridizations of the law. And also I've discussed the, another article on institutional design of Philippine competition law that also speaks about the institutional design uh, of our uh, competition law. So I think uh, that ends my discussion. I hope, I hope you've learned something. Anyway, this is just an introduction to Philippine competition. I know that eventually those taking the 2020, 2020 bar that is moved to 2021, uh, in the review of uh, centers that you'll be attending, your professor will be, uh, the reviewer will be talking about competition law. Also in your commercial law review, I do understand that your commercial law review professor might have also covered um, covered uh, uh, these, uh, this law, which is an emerging law, very unique, very interesting law. Uh, and I hope also eventually in the revised, uh, well, eventually it will be included in the revised curriculum, model law curriculum, it will be included because it's now part of uh, the bar examinations. So again, uh, my dear uh, friends, uh, uh, I hope, I'm sorry if hindi ko na completo yung aking presentations, kung mayroon man akong pagkukulang. I hope I can answer your questions, but I don't have the time, I think. Uh, 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 yes, yeah, so uh, maraming salamat. Thank you very much. I know that some posted some questions. Um, I hope uh, I hope I, I wasn't too fast with my discussions. Thank you, Professor Attorney Leonard Mann, I, that you're, you're listening. Okay, thank you, Philip, John. Uh, Thank you, Babit, Daiwai, Truman, Dibaratan, Daniel, Abu, uh, thank, hello, uh, John uh, Yuson. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Amabel. Uh, yes, you're welcome, Ara Mara. Uh, you're all welcome. Everyone are all welcome. Thank you very much. I hope you've uh, learned something. Uh, if you have any questions, um, I hope we'll bump each other and I can answer your questions. I'll try to answer directly. Uh, uh, your questions to the comment sections. No, I hope I can answer all the questions. Um, once again, I would like to thank the president of the Philippine Associations of Law Schools, PALS, President uh, Dean Mari and uh, Dean Alswade for this awesome uh, project. Uh, I know that it would have been better if there's a slide because uh, we prepared something. My virtual background was then amazing, but unfortunately, there was a problem on the Facebook integration, so I couldn't do it via Zoom. Uh, and so I had to do it through uh, Facebook Live. And so uh, some of you might have a difficulty in following through the discussions because uh, of, you know, you're not, you're, not, you're not seeing the slides, but again, you can download the slides and take note of the amendment, no, the correction that I mentioned kasi my typographical error sa aking uh, uh, slides. So again, uh, please, you can download those articles if you want a more uh, in-depth analysis of the law. I've uh, uh, linked, uploaded the link to uh, uh, the, the slide. So I think... Um, I am, I am done. Oh my God. Thank you so much. And good luck to everyone. You stay at home. I am praying uh, uh, for everyone's good health and safety. Mabuhay po ang uh, Pilipinas. Mabuhay po ang asosasyon ng uh, uh, legal education ng Pilipinas, the Philippine Association of Law Schools. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. Thank you very much indeed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.